was it just you ended up in California and you're like, I'm going to do it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's pretty much it. You know, so growing up in the Midwest, we always like idolized California, right? So when I got old enough and I was done with my apprenticeship, I was a, a, a model maker at the time. I just had a daughter and my wife, she always wanted to serve. So she grew up really in a rural area. So there I was, you know, I had this marketable skill, like, where do I want to go? I was like, let's try California. So yeah. um, I first, I applied for Zodiac, actually. Like, they're, they're up in Eureka, which is up by Washington. And they were just puzzled why I would ever want to move to Eureka. <laughs> so they're like, no, but I was lucky enough. I found a, a shop in San Diego and oh, uh, nice. came into that was the first place I moved. It was, uh, it was awesome. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, I uh, you, we don't do a lot of surfing here in the Midwest. On, no, unlike, unlike yeah. Michigan, right? It's uh, right. It's a little, <laughs> not the vibe. But you know, I did. I I don't know if you do this out there or not, but I did take up longboarding, which is kind of fun. Not exactly surfing, but it's still a lot of. It's. it's I can't do fun. it. I really? can't. I can't stand up. I don't know what it is about my balance or something, but yeah, I just as soon as I get up, fall over. I love being on knees and doing it but I can't, I just don't have the ability. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. That's fun. But, um, yeah. So you, I don't know, man, that's just a, it's a, it's an interesting sport to me to be able to ride a wave. Like, I don't, I don't know that I could pull that off to be honest. You know, I, I suck at it. I'm terrible. I'm absolutely <laughs> horrible. Um, yeah, it's not even great, but I go as much as I can. I haven't gone in a while, but um, it's just being in the water. Yeah. Just there's something about that saline that just hitting your body and just it's so energizing. It's incredible. So if I even if I paddle out and just kind of float there for a little bit, it's just so relaxing and you see fish underneath you. And then I grab a wave and then wipe out, and almost drown. And then I paddle <laughs> back up. <laughs> you know, it's funny you're talking about this because. Well, I mean, since you're from the Midwest, you're, you're, you, you, you know, like Michigan, the Great Lakes and all that. And I remember, I remember taking off from Chicago one time, sitting next to a guy and we're, you know, we're banking out over the, the lake and he'd never seen it before. Mm -hmm. He's like asking me about Lake Michigan. Like he's asking me, he's like, are there sharks down there? Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> like it's Lake Michigan. Sharks? <laughs> he's like, oh, That's great. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great uh, line in high school. Hey, you want to go check out the coral reefs at the lake? You know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Just... But you know, I I do have to say the the surf, if you will, on uh, northern Lake Michigan, like around Upper Wisconsin, is yeah. um, it's pretty harsh. <laughs> it's dramatic when you start getting up north for sure it, yeah well and it, it's interesting because you start to, to that point like you start getting up into the northern great lakes and you start like learning about all the history of the of the shipwrecks because of the oh it's incredible waves and the storm and all this mm -hmm. stuff that rolls through there it's just yeah it's for nuts. sure so so daniel's saying he's got 30 meter wave break right by is 45 minutes away that's amazing yeah and Guys, welcome. Uh, for those of you that are joining us, Eric, I see yeah. you. Yeah, you're surfing the webs. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, Danny, I was lucky enough. I used to live um, by Mavericks up in Central California. And what an amazing story. So that's usually if it's not Hawaii and you see these, you know, 80 foot waves, it's Mavericks. And it's kind of out far. And it's it was actually, I don't remember the exact year, but it was only discovered recently. Maybe it was the 80s or something. Um, someone was out there in a boat and went, holy cow, there's big waves out here. And it just had to do with the way the reef hit and all this other stuff. But um, some of the most amazing surfing that I've ever seen through binoculars. Honestly, it was crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, welcome to those that are joining. We'll get started here. Uh, we'll get started here shortly. But yeah, if you're uh, we're just talking about surfing and like a lot of <laughs> random topics at the moment yeah. but if you surf maybe uh maybe put your favorite location in the uh in the chat and there you uh, go let us know yeah portugal yeah so but yeah it's um 
the water's fun, man. I loved it growing up. I loved going to the Great Lakes and and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, seeing the first time I remember seeing the Pacific. It's just amazing. But, yeah, you know it's funny. And when I first time I saw the Pacific, I grew up in Chicago, so I'm a Lake Michigan guy too. And it's freezing cold year round. So I'm like, oh, you know, you always see these people surfing in the Pacific and they're wearing board shorts. So I thought it was like that all the time. So when I was a kid, I went running out there in December thinking, oh, the water's going to be so warm. Yeah, what a surprise. <laughs> I think like Michigan might have been warmer. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, let's go ahead and kick things off. Welcome, everyone, uh, joining us to, for SolidWorks Live. We're going to uh, take on an interesting topic today, the evolution of manufacturing, which is going to be a, a fun topic. Most of us who design in SolidWorks, we've one way or the other got to figure out how to get the thing built. Uh, and so obviously manufacturing plays a, uh, a really key critical role in that. And I am excited to have a colleague of mine, uh, Chris, join us today. Chris, welcome uh, to the show. You're going to walk us through some pretty uh, pretty exciting stuff. Um, but I also, before we get started, want to encourage everyone uh, in, in attendance to uh, join the conversation in the chat. Take a minute, you know, we'll ask, ask questions as we're going along. I'm going to do my best to follow the chat uh, as we go and uh, pipe those questions to Chris. And so, you know, join us, have a conversation with us in the chat. Should be a lot of fun. But Chris, let's uh, let's kick things off. And and uh, where where are we going? Where, where are you going to take us today on this? Yeah, I, let's talk about that. And just really quickly before I get started, I would love to have a conversation with all of our viewers. And, you know, those of you that might be the first, this might be the first time, this is what this is, right? Lives are Steve and I talking with our users and, you know, the community. So please, you know, any topic, bring it in. So today I'm going to be talking about manufacturing and pretty much the evolution of manufacturing and how important what Dassault is doing for manufacturing, right? In the ad, it's, I, I called it dope. It was funny. I was talking to Sean about it and he says, I was, I'm just really excited about manufacturing, you know? So I, I threw a bunch of D words out there, like dangerous, dark, dirty, dope. And he put the one he, the one he called, grabs onto is dope, but <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I, I would say that it's so really exciting and a game changer of how, and I, really what I'm going to do is this isn't a sales pitch. What I want to do is kind of tell everybody that's viewing and explain how the platform and 3D experience itself handles data and why that's so important in manufacturing. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think that's interesting because I, I know both as an AE and a little bit from experience, right? This this handoff between design and engineering and manufacturing of those models. It's it's an it's historically been a little interesting, like the the back and forth, the, that 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 data transfer, and, and making sure the right thing is getting there that the the code can be created off of. So, I think this is going to be a good. This will be good. Yeah, for sure. It's I'm really excited about it. And okay, so for the record, I hate PowerPoints, right? So, but I think if you don't mind, I want to take two minutes just to kind of explain because if we give everybody the overview i think you're going to understand a little bit more we were talking about handoffs right so whenever you have this is the evolution of any product in the world right we don't make cartoons here we make products right we're making great engineering models and things like that so everything goes right from an idea design we know we know this we've seen this a million times right but here's the problem and this is something that people just kind of deal with right so what is getting handed off? When we talk about throwing stuff over a wall, what's getting thrown over the wall, right? So from the idea, it's a piece of paper, right? And then what's getting thrown over the wall from design to engineering, right? It could be a rhino file, it could be anything, any kind of file, it could be a scan, right? So then in engineering, we're producing solid part files, solid assembly files, maybe IGES files. Maybe you're not unfortunately using SolidWorks, right? Maybe you're, you're forced to use something else, right? So you get other files. And then so on and so forth, you can see throughout this whole thing. And that's the problem because let's say in manufacturing has a problem, right? And they have a master cam file. Hey, I want you to see this master cam file. It doesn't go backwards. Like you can't go back and make it a design file. And that's where we really run into problems. And that's where the parametricity and the parametricness, I always get those confused. It's one of those 
being parametric, there you go, is super important, right? And that's what we talk about SolidWorks all the time because you can go forward and back in SolidWorks. It doesn't make a difference, right? Dude, let's, go with, this, let's, let's, let's go with parametricity. I'm, there, I'm, I love it. Parametricity. I, I've never heard of that, but I mean, like, let's just make it a thing. Let's it's go. it. It's it today. Parametricity. <laughs> I want everybody to use that at least two times today. All right. So <laughs> what happens when we take those files away, right? What happens when we take those file extensions away? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be awesome if we had one file extension with no uh, translation whatsoever, all the way from an idea all the way to shipping. Wouldn't that be mm -hmm. wild, right? Yeah. Well, that's really what we do, right? With 3D Experience Works, not only do we have that one file, but everybody's in that platform. So everybody has access to that same file, that same file format um, throughout the entire process. So listen, I, I said this isn't a sales pitch and it's really not. And really what I'm trying to do is kind of explain and, and, and making a foundation to understand that the way we've been doing things up to now has been great because those were the tools we had, right? We have better tools now, right? We don't have point solutions anymore. We have cloud solutions, right? Nice. We have okay. faster everything, you know, and it's, I'm sorry, I get really excited, but anyway, I just wanted, I, I, I again, I hate PowerPoints, but um, I just wanted to point that out. So we're all on the same page. No, I, I think it's good. And I think, um, you know, I actually got to experience a little of this with you firsthand the other day mm -hmm. where you and I were working on a project and you're like, you know, like, no, all I've got it. All I have to give you is this 3D, 3D XML and it's going to have everything you need. And I was like, that's amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And it's great. And, and the best thing, the thing that I like about it the most is it's pretty much seamless throughout. And what I, what I would run into the shop, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stop making this sound like sales pitch, but when I was in the shop, really the biggest thing is I was using SurfCam back in the day. You know, so I was doing surfaces, and then I get SolidWorks files, and then I'd have to translate them and things like that. And and we all know we've all been there. You know, when you're in the shop and you get uh, that's funny Eric. when you get a when you get a file in and you have a problem and you got to send it back you have a bunch of files right this is what pdm is right is is managing those files but what happens when you don't have to manage 20 different types of files right it makes your day just so much easier so much easier right. for sure okay. right. so should we uh should we get in uh, yeah, uh, get into it. the software a little bit and see yeah, let's do some it. of this in action yeah so I think I'm, there we go, share my screen. All right, this is awesome. So what we're seeing here is what we call a manufacturing cell, right? This is called a bowhead swing arm. Um, you guys really, bowhead, remember that name. Because <laughs> we, we've we been doing a lot of stuff with their with their data. You might've seen some, uh, some videos that Steve actually put together that were phenomenal. So if you see any of those, make sure to see them. But so this is a machining cell that we made with uh, their data. And in this cell, right, we have a couple different things going on. We have a, a robot and we also have a CNC machine, right? Those are the cells. So really what I could do is, like, actually let's do this first. Um, really what I could do is open these up in their own software using the same file and things like that. But really what I'm able to do here is program this part and simulate this robot all within the same file, right? There are some stuff on here I could hide. So let me go ahead and just, just hide a couple of these. Oop, there we go. Center it on there. There we go. Come back. There we are. All right, so we saw the robot. Let me go ahead and play that again. So we saw the robot simulation. It's great. It's awesome. It's going to play. I love robots. Hey, if anybody in the chat, you guys, if you guys are, are using industrial robots, you know, just give me a plus one or something in the chat. It'd be amazing. So as I'm going through this, I want to point out a couple of things that are pretty rad about this too is, so what we're used to is digital twins and digital twins are basically just a graphic representation of what you're doing, right? It's just whatever. It doesn't have any data. It's like a cartoon. It's a 3D square cylinder whatever that you can spin around a virtual twin what we're talking about here actually takes into consideration the kinematics and because of that i can do things like simulate in real time All right so this is sped up right but if mm -hmm. really with the feeds and speeds that i have i can actually this is what it's actually going to look like on the shop floor 
right? This is how fast it's going to go. Okay, so enough of robots. That's great. So let's talk about that's only one part of the manufacturing well, process. Can I ask a quick? Can I oh, ask a please, question yeah, bring it, bring it, bring it. So, so, so in, in some ways, you look at this, and and this is like just a cool animation. But I guess what are are you saying that this is more than that? Like it's not a, you're programming the robot, but then you're also able to analyze. I guess maybe you're saying the the cycle time related to the part as it relates to that yeah. robot and the machining that's happening. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, one okay. of the, the, yeah, when I would, when you're in the shop, right. Feeds and speeds are important, right? Like how fast this is going to go. And that's one of the, you know, that's one of the, the, the things us machine is kind of, Oh yeah, it's, it's voodoo magic. You guys don't know. You guys can understand it. But what this is doing, right. One of the reasons it's, it's so elusive is you can't, 99% of the time with the software out there, you can't actually see on your screen how fast that tool is going to move, right? So with a virtual twin, right, what you're seeing is the actual speed of that machine. And that's something that's pretty rare. Okay. You know, and it, so rare. I guess the other question I have is like, so are there, did you build the machine or is the machine, is the is there like a library of them that you're able to pull from? Yeah, that's a great question. And there are the, both of those, bo both of those are right, right? So we have a library of machines, um, some generic machines that we are, um, uh, that we use, that we can uh, supply to you. Uh, your best source is probably uh, the reseller who you buy the software from. They're really good with if you have a, a strange machine, like I don't know, some built in Italy, 18 axis, crazy laser cutter. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. We can model that for you without a doubt. We can model that for you for sure. Okay. Yeah. Looks like we, uh, we had a good question come in. What role and app yeah. are you using? Um, uh, Mike Bookley. Hey, yeah. so Mike, uh, robot programmer is the role it's being shown and factory simulation, um, is, is what's being used to calculate, uh, the right. throughput. So that's, that's awesome. So I, I, I like, that's a great question. And Daniel actually asked this question too, like what role and app are you using? So another thing that, we, that I re really appreciate the way Dassault is doing this, <clears throat> excuse me, is instead of just an app or, a, a, we're, okay, so <laughs> applications now are programs, right? Like MasterCam's a program. No, no, we're talking about apps now. So when we talk about apps, right, they're basically programs. Okay. So <laughs> I like it built in Italy too. What Dassault has done is they realize that if you have a role in your company, let's say you're an NC shop programmer, right? This is going to be your role. When you have this role, here are all of the apps you're going to need, right? If you have that role, it's broken down into these apps. You're going to need to collaborate. These are these top ones here. You're going to have to program some stuff. Here's your laser cutter. Here's your shop floor programmer. Here's your wire EDM. It's amazing, right? But you know, that's different than maybe somebody that is a SolidWorks user, right? They're going to have simulation, they're going to have solid or a simulation user. Um, another manufacturing, like program, um, somebody said robot programmer, that's the role that you're seeing right now with the robot, right? They don't need to program mm -hmm. a machine, but they need the collaboration. So when we talk about roles and apps, like what role is this, right? Right now, I, I'm in the role of robot programmer. Um, I can't, I'm going to switch in a second to uh, NC programmer. And we can do that a couple ways. Go ahead, please. Yeah, no, it's great. I, so uh, we ran a quick poll with the audience and it's just, mm -hmm. uh, they, they gave us feedback. 60, 65% have not actually worked with industrial robotics before. So that's kind of interesting. That is interesting. That's really interesting. And, you know, I can tell you that for sure, if you haven't yet, you're gonna. Um, there's 400,000, I believe, was the number of robots entering the market every year industrial robots so you know if if you don't have them now they're definitely closing in on you for sure <laughs> um we've seen some really interesting applications for industrial robots not just pick and place which is what you saw um welding um material application you know i, I joked about the d's in the beginning and we talked about dirty dark and dangerous right so if you have anything in your um in your facility now that's any one of those things you're definitely going to uh, have a robot at some point for sure yeah yeah I, I, definitely I, the thing i've seen a lot of is the is definitely like the welding robots uh, yeah 
just the ability to, I guess, I guess you'd say the repeatability and the ability to get into places where it would be tough otherwise to, to get to. Um, You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I was, uh, I was working with, uh, Mike Buckley, actually, um, we were going over a welding program together and, you know, it's a little bit of both, right? There's part, there's parts that are just made for people because people can bend in weird ways and lean over and they can take a little bit of liberty with some of the applications, right? Ah, it's not exactly at a 30 degree angle. Ah, I don't care. I'll just blob it in there. You know, whereas with robots, you have to be, you know, a lot more specific. Sure. Yeah, for sure. All right. So I, here we go. I opened it back up, got out a robot programmer, shop floor machining. Mm -mm. So this you're taking us into now transitioning from robots. It sounds like into the, the programming of a, of a part. You're absolutely right. So within this whole cell, what I did is I activated just the CNC machine. So remember, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to hide them but I'm not, I'm not gonna delete them. I'm just gonna go ahead and hide the robot here. Go ahead and hide these things too. So what we're seeing down here is this is actually, not only is there robotics programmed on this, but also, also factory flow and factory automation. Um, I didn't have time to go over that today. That'll be another one for sure is factory automation. And we talked about that a little bit, you and I, Steve, and you know that's another big part of manufacturing that is becoming very, very important is the, um, that is really getting the most out of your factory. All right, so you can see I, I'm in shop floor machining. I did a couple things, right? I, I hid the door so we can see it. So now let's go ahead and we can just check the tool path on here. And again, what we're looking at here, this is another virtual twin, like this whole thing is a virtual twin, right? So what we're seeing here is really what we're going to see on the shop floor. Okay. Come up here. Let me go ahead and turn on some uh, material removal because that always looks cooler. There we go. Maybe why Chris is doing this as well to the audience. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you're facing with manufacturing, whether it's your CNC machining, your, your, your floor layouts, your, um, you know, through your cycle times, what are some of those things that you guys are, are con looking to, to really challenge and, and, and get some resolution to, uh, in mm -hmm. your own plans. Yeah. So I can come in here. That's a great question. And that's what we're here for you guys. I mean, we're here to help you guys and, and this is great, right? This is whatever it's cam. You've seen it, right? I'm going to come here and I'm just going to show just really quickly how we can, let me double click on here. So just for a second, I'm just going to show the programming part of this just to bring it in the full circle. So right here, I can actually come around. I can actually change the tool on this, right? I said, oh, okay, I can just, you know, whatever. I want to pick another tool. My tool lists are here. I want to use, I don't know, I forget which one, three quarter of an inch tool. Simulate that, it'll show it. Now, just keep, let's keep in mind for a second, like how this whole thing started, right? I started with, let me go ahead and get out of this a complete model, a complete manufacturing model. And this is, this is the part that I was, when I was talking about, this is dope to me. This is just absolutely ridiculous to me is that we started with robot and I just went ahead and I just hit it. And I said, let's go ahead and let's program this machine. There was no, okay, I want to take that robot. I'm going to close down my robot programmer. I'm going to open up my CNC machining now. Okay, hold on. I got to wait for that to load. Right. There was no, hold on. Let me, okay. I got this file. Let me drag it into this window and open it up. Everything not only happened in the same window, right? Each app worked in the same program, right? I never left this. It's amazing. This is the part that's incredible to me. I You don't ever have to bop over from Mastercam to SolidWorks or SurfCam to something else. It is just absolutely amazing. So Eric had a good question. Can you verify, clarify if... Uh, this is the same NC shop floor programmer role yes. that is available mm -hmm. in the SOLIDWORKS maker subscription, or is there a more expansive role with more apps? There, are, there's there, both of those are true. 
<laughs> this what you're seeing right now there's three plus two i'm sorry so with the regular shot floor programmer role um you get three axis uh plus two positional right so we call it three plus two so you can move it machine it move it machine it um the more expansive roles are oh i'm sorry just let me back up for a second you get three plus two plus you get single point single point cutting so lasers water jets you name it um and nesting so that's all that you get with the maker stuff now when you talk about advanced roles right we're, when we do the way that we did the the pricing on this is we didn't want to nickel and dime you like we're not going to charge you oh you need machine simulation that's more no we broke it down into okay now you want to do mill turn that would be the advanced option right it's really by the size of your machine after that and how much you need to do the most advanced option would be multi-axis mill turn but yeah, all of the features you see that I'm doing right here come with the base rolls. We have uh, Mihita saying, I want to name that single file as a gigafile. <laughs> <laughs> I love it because it's way better than a mega file. Yeah, it's fair. <laughs> I, you know, it, it is interesting, you know, when we talk about the evolution, the kind of the topic of, of, of the day is that it feels like you can get into this at any, in any entry point you want like if you're if you're trying to machine that and that's all i want to be able to do then great build your cnc code and whatnot but if you're but if i'm part of that you know 65 percent of the audience that's never done robotic programming mm -hmm. at at the point that i'm ready to be able to do that or want to be able to do that i can i can i can right it's that same environment that you just talked absolutely about. yeah and you know that was one of the things i really loved uh, when I was in the SOLIDWORKS channel was, you know, <laughs> I'm going to age myself again. You know, I, I think I used SOLIDWORKS to design the wheel. And I think that speaks for the age of both me and SOLIDWORKS. But um, when I was in there, it was so cool because you that was the first time I'd ever really seen you could be in one window and they had Cosmos back then, right? <laughs> but if you don't want to do simulation now, you can do it later. And it's right inside the same window and we just added on, right? This is the evolution of that, right? This is the evolution of more than just, oh, if you want it, we can just put a little hook in it and add it on. All of that, again, the D, manufacturing is data now. It is, and the way that we handle it. And that's the thing that I really wanted to point out. Imagine the amount of data that I'm, I, I'm pushing around here, right? Motion data, um, kinematic data, weight, velocity, all of these things are are taken into account in this and you know i love solidworks and all but i challenge any standalone program to be able to use data the way that you're you were able to in this platform and even leveraging the solidworks data in here is just absolutely incredible absolutely incredible so i guess the that We've got a, probably a lot of SolidWorks users, obviously, on the call. What happens when they make a, a design change? And I might be able to, I might be getting ahead of you, but what what happens yeah. when that model geometry changes uh, with with what you've got here? No, that's that's a really great question. So there's a lot of there's a lot to that, right? There's a lot to change orders um, depending on the way your organization is built, right? Um, I've worked in small shops, mom and pop shops, where it was me and another guy running three machines. Change orders were the boss coming out and saying, hey, stop, change it and giving me the new file or something, right? There's still shops like that out there, but I think more, more than likely you're, there, there's a chain of command there, right? It's gonna go through the engineering department and all that stuff, and there's all this documentation. And the nice thing about that, you know, is at that point, we can just come over here and say, okay, what's the, what's the part that we need to, what's the part that we need to change, right? Because we can come up here and just say, you know, we're, we're just going to go ahead and replace that part. Oh, I can't find it right now, but it's in here. So we can actually just come in, take this object and replace it with the new part. Um, because, you know, remember in that first, in that, 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 that PowerPoint, I hate to use it, the graphical representation of the thing. Now that PowerPoint that I did at the very end, right? It, we're all in a square together. We're all there together. So if there's a change order, it's the same file format, right? It's in the mm -hmm. same folder. It's in the same group. It's in the same project. It's great. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, good. So, so I can swap that new geometry in and everything 
Yeah, it's it's just yeah. down mm-hmm. downstream. Okay, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, so, Steve, let me ask you a question, or, or everybody on this, everybody on the line. Let me ask you guys a question, right? What is the biggest problem that you? And this isn't a loaded question because I want to know. I really, honestly, want to know these days. What is your major hurdle when dealing with manufacturing? Right? I can tell you what I think it is, right? But I'm kind of biased, right? So, what is your biggest hurdle? What do you What do you think? Honestly, Stephen, again, this I'm not. I'm not. This isn't a trap. I really want to know. Like, what do you think the biggest hurdle is? Man, I think. I I guess I would wager to say I, I guess i'll take the perspective between maybe engineering and manufacturing is is like communicating the accurate data back and forth when changes mm-hmm. do happen i would mm-hmm. i i get the sense that that still is a there's still some heartburn associated with that handoff between mm-hmm. whatever you know solid works and then mm-hmm. whatever cam solution you might be <clears throat> you might be utilizing in reconciling what's been designed with what actually can be machined and maybe mm-hmm. what needs to be added in order for it to be successfully machined mm-hmm. whether it's mm-hmm. hold points or, or or things like that so i don't know that that would be i guess my guess i i'm with you i'm kind of in- no, no 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 there's no yeah no no there's no wrong answer i think you're right i mean i i think all of that I, I, we see some stuff in the chat i mean a lot of people are talking about communication of data right and that's kind of what i thought too you know, being, being in the shop and being a shop guy. Right. I mean, we're, we're kind of at the, and not, not, in a, not in a discriminating way, but we're kind of at the bottom of the chain, right. We're at the, we're, you know, everything kind of comes down to us. Right. So th- when you think about the chain of command, there's that the, the amount of data grows, right. From the design, from a napkin sketch, you know, all the way through engineering, by the time it gets to us, there's just so much. And I think that really is the problem. And, you know, back in the day, again, I mean, before, when I was doing my apprenticeship, we were running off of drawings, you know, and we would sit there with a drawing for an injection mold and we would just go over the drawing for a few days and just talk about how we're going to do it and who's going to do what and how all of that stuff's going to work out. And that was the way that we communicated. And mm-hmm. it was slow, you know, and, and I think that's really with what our customers need today. What I'm seeing with engineers, it's speed, man. Yeah. It's absolute speed. And the SolidWorks users are so incredibly fast. It's so great. So this is a great point that I think Daniel is yeah. his view on is manufacturing is not just NC code to controller, it's process. What yes. tools, setups, tolerances, what to inspect, what surface treatment. Yeah. Yeah. So you hit a bunch of things there, Daniel. So um, this is another great thing that I really like about Delmia and the way Delmia handles data. Um, they use those, right? So it's not just NC code. Absolutely, thank you for saying that, right? It is a process. And that was kind of the idea of that first slide, right? It's not just, okay, here's NC code that. What we really want to talk about, what we really want to do is solve the entire manufacturing problem, right? Um, here, let me share my let me share my screen just really quickly again. And um, you can see that machine. Now we're I drilled down to the part, right? I started with this big manufacturing cell and then I got, I didn't get rid of, I hid the robot, just showed the machine, showed that. But if we dig down even deeper, right, we can see that on this machine, we actually have these accessories that have their own mechanics, right? Their own representation, right? Their own moving parts. And we can create work instructions from these vices and ship those with the part or with the code or whatever um, to the shop, right? Titan Vice ABC before you do anything. Um, it's huge, right? The so, nice thing. Oh, oh, go ahead, please. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So I'm going to stop you just for a minute because that's kind of interesting to me. Brilliant. So, so is that is that information something that's just been built into the intelligence of that that part, like the like I, I have this vice and I'm, I'm going to build that out as part of the, that vice is, I guess, attached data that I can yes, then utilize. Absolutely. Ab- yep. So you build it out. You, you know, that's, that's another great thing, again, I, about having a virtual twin, not a digital twin. If this was just a digital twin, I could just take this, highlight it, move it in, no repercussions, it would happen, right? No big deal. It's just a visit. But 
if I did that here, right, it really affects the entire, here we go, it's this one, you know, the entire tree of all of these parts because there's so much to that, right? That's really important, right? And once you build this, you can reuse it throughout your throughout your facility. Now, one thing that I just want to point out really quickly is, um, you know, we, we've shown this to some people. And one of the things they say is, I don't want to have to build my own machine. I don't have to build these vices. I have a vice. I just want to throw it on the vice and do it. And that's great. And you know what? You can do it. You don't have to do all this stuff. You can make digital, or you just make a digital representation and go for it. But at some point, you're going to have to go to the shop and you're going to have to put a vice on your on your table, right? And you're going to have to zero that tool out, right? You're going to have to put the material on the vice and you're going to have to, and now all of a sudden, maybe it's exactly what you had on your cam, maybe it's not, right? Mm. Here, you know for sure it is, right? Again, the virtual twin, it has instructions, setup instructions, you've modeled this exactly like your machine. So there's no surprises. There really isn't. And it's great. And oh, so going back to down, just a couple of things. See, we talk about tolerances, what to inspect, surface treatments, what what's important, what's not important. So th that's uh, manufacturer um, manufacturing instructions, you know, things like that. Um, that's a whole different thing. And that's a solid works part. And they're working on it. They're doing a pretty good job at that, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's great, Daniel. Thank you. And that's really the point of this is encompassing everything that has to do with manufacturing, not just NC code. That's great. So I guess I'm in, I'm intrigued now a little bit. Is there, are there other little like hidden gems like the work instructions and and whatnot that that just come along for the ride once you once you have once you have this stuff set up in your library? Yeah, there's all kinds of things you can do. Um, I have. So this is kind of like this, the, the middle step of the entire process. Um, I went ahead and hid these in the beginning, these, these behaviors. And really what these are for is these are to show the movement on the shop floor, right? And I have a video, but I'm not, I'm not gonna bore you guys with another weird little video, but by using, by going one step further with um, factory automation and our shop floor, um, I'm sorry, our factory simulation, is you can actually generate reports about the entire process. You know, how long each one of these things are taking, how long is the robot moving? How long is it taking to move apart? How long are these little carts taking to bring material to the arm? Um, how long is the machine taking, right? These are all reports that, you know, back in the day we would print out, right? But, you know, now we have these things called dashboards. And on these dashboards, we have these little widgets and I don't have any set up right now, but we have these widgets where you can just say, hey, you know what, show me, show me the current state of these carts right now. How long is this taking? So it's a, it's a constant real time update of what's happening on the shop floor. And that there's a little bit of magic there with um, something called Delmia Works. Um, not a lot of people have heard of that yet. You guys are, you guys on the, if you guys on the line, Trust me, you're going to hear a lot about Delmia Works in the coming year. So um, keep your ear out. But um, the things that you're able to measure, analyze, and report um, within the platform is incredible. So what happens, Chris, if, and I guess I don't want to deviate too much from your presentation here, but oh, bring one, it, man. One, one question I did have is, is so... so I think we've talked a fair bit about kind of this evolution of the data flowing towards manufacturing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, engineering toward to manufacturing, but, but what happens in situations if, if information needs to go back the other way, like, uh, let's say I need to like redline something, or I need to point out sure. something that engineering design needs to adjust before I can, you know, I can machine this or, or, or create this, this part. Yeah. So inside of this, and I'm trying to find the, I'm trying to find the icon because there's a couple of them. We actually have a markup feature that you can actually create markups in the, in this window using the 3d model uh, set up. No, that's uh, somewhere. I forget. Oops. Never me. No. So I apologize for this, but you know, there's, <laughs> I didn't organize my, um, my markup tabs enough. I apologize. Uh, but yeah, you're able to actually create 3D markups and actually share them across um, your facility. And within the platform, you're actually also able to send alerts to the designer, the engineer, 
you can basically label whoever you want to um, to alert when there's a markup. And the nice thing about these markups is they actually attach themselves to the file. So mm -hmm. let's say I open this up. Remember, I, again, to remind everybody, you know, this is all one quote unquote file that I opened up. It's a 3D XML file. And really a 3D XML file is a file that contains a bunch of um, a bunch of objects, right? So within those objects can be, you know, your reports, your markups and things like that. And we also have a co-review with peers. So you can actually do a review of the part um, live with um, through either chat or through the platform. You know, okay. it's funny, Mike and I, Mike lives in Nebraska and he was working on a part for his tractor and uh, I was kind of helping him while he's in the, while he's in the barn doing it. And um, it was actually pretty incredible. I think we actually used the feature, the chat feature and the picture feature and the markup feature back and forth for me to kind of help him. OK, you know, this is where that goes and instructions like that. It, it's a pretty incredible feature. Uh, and again, it's all about communication and that open flow of communication. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point, right? Because so many of our the manufacturing is is dispersed in a lot of mm -hmm. ways. Um, and so having that way of yeah, I, I can see where that would be really valuable, being able to all oh, especially the same, now. Yeah, the same thing. Mm -hmm. This is, so I guess another thing, um, question that comes to mind, and by the way, for our audience, if you have questions, uh, by all means, please put them in the chat. I would love to, I'd love to um, uh, pass those along to, to Chris, but Chris, when it comes to like the tooling and the fixtures, the work holding, and I guess even the code, is that mm -hmm. is that able to be versioned or revision managed and kind of, I guess, traced, if you will? Like, is there a way to correlate all of that in case, you know, yeah. something does change and we've got to be able to get back to, you know, what it is we used when we Absolutely. built that part? Yeah, that's 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 a really great question. So there's us in the shop. We've, we've figured out ways around these things, right? Like, OK, I'm going to try this. I'm going to put this file over here and monkey around with it. But put this one over here and, you know, I, it just becomes so confusing. Right. Yeah. With the file management here, what we can do is we can actually go back to earlier versions um, that we've created um, of the tool path of the part. Um, all the toolpath, again, is all contained and referenced to this model. So it's difficult for me to convey what I'm trying to say because everything's so different than what I was used to and what everybody on here is used to. You know, we're talking about files and it's really not files. We're really talking about objects, right? This machine, right? This machine, I don't have a file of a Haas, right? I have, this is my object, is my Haas. And in that object are all of these things. So that being said, an object can be anything right? It can sure. be a machine data. It could be an NC code in a text file. It could be a PDF. It could be whatever you want it to be. So within these files, it can contain, re 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 sorry, revised versions. There we go. Of earlier context and past versions too. Yeah. It was a tongue okay. twister. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Very good. So okay, let me ask you guys on that. Let me ask you guys on the on the on the chat. We're gonna, we're all honest, right? This is the tree of trust, right? The tree of engineering trust here, right? Do you guys engineer? I'm not just gonna assume engineer. We'll even say we'll go both ways. Engineers, do you feel like you have an open line of communication with the shop? Like, do you feel comfortable going out of the shop and being like, guys, there's a change, and vice versa, right? Manufacturing guys, like, do you feel comfortable going upstairs and being like, hey? I can't machine this, you know, and I would think that machinists are kind of more crabby. I'm one. I can say that just for the record. And I'm grouchy. And I've been up to engineer engineering and said, seriously, like, why is this whole, you know, 0. 0.490, dude? Come on, man. Like, you don't want that, you know, but just curious, you know, let me know what you guys think, um, because we don't like talking to people anymore in general right? We're machines and engineers. We didn't like talking to people before. So now after COVID and everything, we hate, we like, we don't like talking to people even, I mean, we like talking to people less, right? <laughs> so that's one of the other things I really love about this is because when I deal with people like Steve, who I like to talk to, right, we can get on the phone and we can discuss it, right? 
um, when I'm on the, when I have a file from somebody else, I can really mark it up and I can get that communication to them and get that information to them in a succinct way, right? Where they'll understand it without me having to talk to them, right? That's the dot, dot, dot without me having to talk to that part. So that's really why I'm curious about this. Like how you guys feel about that, right? Um, it's important for us, Stephen. I think you'd agree, right? Let's be realistic. We're, we both work for Dassault um, and we love our jobs. We really do. And it's amazing. Um, but we have a tendency, we, I, I feel at least that I need to reach out, right? I need to reach out to the, the, the community and remind me again, like how you guys are feeling. Well, how is that? Because I don't want to tell you how you feel. I want to know. So thank you. I, I was just curious. I'm, I'm really, really excited to see that poll. Yeah, we've got a poll going, uh, by all means, go ahead and, uh, and answer. Uh, we'd love to, we'd love to have that feedback. And I think Chris, I think it's a good point. I think sometimes we do have to step out of our comfort zone. I know when I was in industry, I, um, believe it or not, was actually fairly shy and, and sometimes out of necessity and sometimes just out of, uh, um, uh, pure need would, would, would definitely go talk to the, to the machinists and the welders and the, and, and whatnot. And what's funny is, is that as I, as I did, I, I always came away, uh, always came away better for it because I would gain mm -hmm. insight. I would gain knowledge in, you know, better ways of doing things. And, uh, it is a, it is a strange, there's a little bit of a strange wall sometimes between those two that really yeah. probably doesn't need to be there. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. And, you know, when I was coming up through the trades, um, you know, it was like dealing with your like the crabbiest uncle you ever had, you know, like you had to ask him for like a ride to school or something. And you're like, oh, my God, I got to talk to this guy again, you know, but I think it's changed a lot. I think a lot of people have got gotten humble with what they know because because technology has gotten so advanced in manufacturing sure you know you have the old european uh machinists right they can do everything by hand they can cut these angles freehand on a mill like it's crazy but we don't we need those people in the trades right but we don't need to rely on them as much and i think they realize that so i think a lot more people these days are a lot more willing um to not be that crabby uncle right um, and be more willing to say, Hey, come here, let me show you how this is because us old guys, right. We need to know about what's coming up and what these, well, you know, what's important to the engineers. It's really, I think that's really, really important. So Chris, we're, we're, uh, heading into the last part of our time together. What, is there anything else you want to share with us or convey about kind of how this is, uh, evolving? You know, really, the biggest thing I want to point out is you used evolving, and it's such an amazing word for this. It really, you know, manufacturing, everybody on this, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I'm seeing it. I've been around. Manufacturing is evolving, right? It's not getting parts on and off the machine is the priority anymore, right? Sure, it's there, right? But the priority is not getting the part on and off the machine. It's getting the part in and out of the shop, right? And that's what we realize. Um, really, you know, I want everybody to realize that everybody on this line, I'm, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, everybody on this line is an amazing SolidWorks user, right? You guys could crush it on SolidWorks, right? That bottleneck in engineering is over, right? You guys, everybody on this line, you guys you guys have, have, have helped eliminate that barrier of design barrier, right? Because we're so quick. What's the next barrier for getting that part out of your building, right? It's manufacturing. Yeah. So, you know, really kind of pay attention about how those lines are bleeding over, you know, especially pay attention, honestly, even in Outlook the next year or two. And I'm not just saying with the so this isn't anything with us. I'm just saying in the in general, the next year or two with AI um, and robotics, those two things with software and hardware are really going to change um, what we see as manufacturing. And I just wanted to let say thank you to you and thank you to everybody that was on here i love if you can't tell i love talking about making stuff and manufacturing and software reach out to me everybody on here i would i'll talk to you forever about this stuff so and steve <laughs> i can't thank you enough for having me on here thank you yeah no we uh we've enjoyed having you and you know to your point it seems like things are 
trending in a, in a, in a positive way, 65% or 62% of the people responded feel like, yeah, we've got a, an open line of communication with awesome. the, with the shop. So I think that's, uh, it's great. That's really encouraging. So absolutely. Very good. Well, Chris, thanks again for uh, spending some time with us today, answering all my uh, my, my dumb questions <laughs> about <laughs> about uh, about uh, nah. manufacturing and and uh, helping to educate me on on some of this uh, the the trends in this as well. So I appreciate it. Always a pleasure. For everyone on, uh, I want to make you aware of just a few upcoming uh, things that we have in, in the works when it comes to our live series. Uh, one of which is uh, on August 31st, we have the Best of Live Design 2023. So this will be an amazing opportunity for you to, to get a catch up, kind of a, I guess we're a little bit past the mid-year, but just an amazing chance to get a, get all caught up on anything highlights that you that you may have missed, um, you'll have an opportunity to do so on August 31st. So be sure to uh, make sure you're subscribed and uh, um, notify, have the notification bell turned on uh, when it comes to that. Uh, another uh, event that we're excited about is on September 5th, we'll have a manufacturing live. This is gonna be a great one. We're gonna have Tom Buxton, uh, who's a technical manager from one of our partners, uh, talk about his journey into a career of manufacturing. Uh, and so that's going to be a, that's going to be a great, uh, a, a great episode that you're going to want to turn in, uh, tune in for. Uh, and then finally, this is the big one. The, the, uh, the one that I know a lot of us uh, wait all year for, uh, you know, that you've got experience, uh, 3d experience world and you've got what's new, right? Those are the two like things that we all get very, very excited about. Uh, and so we're going to have our what's new 2024, uh, SolidWorks live episode. We're going to have, uh, a number of experts on walking you through, um, the, the, the new functionality, the new features, you're not going to want to miss this, um, and this is going to be a special Wednesday episode of SolidWorks Live. So a little bit different. We typically do these on Thursdays, but this one you're going to want to make sure you get on your calendar as when for Wednesday, September 27th uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern. So again, be sure to subscribe, turn the notification bell on. You know how this works, the, you know the drill, but we really do want you to be uh, informed of... Um, uh, of what's coming up because there's a lot of great speakers and a lot of great content in the works for the rest of the year. So with that, again, I want to just extend a thank you for joining us today on uh, the evolution of manufacturing. Uh, I hope you found it helpful, insightful, uh, maybe walked away with a few uh, uh, insights related to uh, what Dassault is doing from a manufacturing standpoint, and maybe some things that you can just uh, be challenged on a little bit to, to, to think about in the way that your uh, manufacturing operations are, are currently uh, working. So with that, I want to wish you a great weekend. Enjoy the rest of your Friday, and we'll see you next time.